Good morning, Big House. I wasn't expecting to see you this way, but here we are. So take a moment and invite someone to join you online for church this morning. God has a word for us and they need to hear it. Grab your coffee. We'll be right back in just a minute. fails me and for all my days I've been held in your hand and from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God yeah. and all my life you have been faithful Goodness of God, yeah. 
so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God Sing that one more time, say And all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Yes, with every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God.
He's a love like no other. I've carried a burden for too long on my own, and I wasn't created to bear it. Yeah, I see it now I'm laying it down And I know I need you now I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding No reason to wait And my heart needs a surgeon My soul needs a friend So I run to the Father saw my condition had a plan from the start and your son for redemption and the price for my heart and I don't have a context for that kind of love I don't understand For my first breath And running into your arms Is running to life from death And I feel it now Deep in my chest Your mercy is calling out Just as I am You call me in And I know Done with the hiding, reason to wait. My needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again.
There is so much going on in the world around us. This is an unprecedented and crazy time in our lifetimes. And if you don't remember, it's also an election year in America. So anything could happen. And it's most of it probably about that election. Many today are feeling lonely. They're feeling uncertain. It feels like so much of our lives are out of control. It feels both chaotic and crazy to some, and then hope-filled and inspiring to others. This probably depends on who you're listening to and what you're reading. I believe as followers of Jesus, we ought to be listening to the Holy Spirit and reading God's Word. This is how we will find comfort in the chaos. This is how we'll find our feet and our faith in the frenzy. With Jesus, we'll find the courage to look inward and outward, and we will have the wisdom to know what the right next step to take is. This may all be new for us, but it's not new for God. We need to see what is really going on in our world today. It's time to open our eyes and see the truth from God's perspective. And I believe that the Lord has something to say to the church today. And my prayer is that you will be able to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to you. And so I'm going to invite you to pray and in your way, ask God to give you the ability to hear what he's saying to you in particular, maybe to the church in general. So let's just take a moment and pray. Father, I would ask that in Jesus' name, you would open the eyes of our heart, that we might see you, Jesus. Open our spiritual ears, that we might hear you, Holy Spirit. And Father, would we be able to sense your direction for our lives and for the life of your church this morning? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was over 20 years ago that we planted our first church in Los Angeles, California. It was more of a replant, uh, a small church that had run its course. The church had gone down to about 12 to 20 people, but it had land in a hard to get area of the South Bay. And the people who were remaining were just wonderful people and they desired to make a difference in that community. I gotta tell you, the South Place was a, the South Bay was a difficult place to plant a church. It was the experience of planning Cornerstone Christian Fellowship that proved to me that there's more to ministry than meets the eyes. Until this point, most of my understanding of of spiritual battles, power structures, institutional dimensions, and local context was theory. It was unimplied knowledge. I was at best spiritually naive. And I thought we would simply just plant a church in the city of Manhattan Beach spread the good news of the gospel, and win hundreds, even thousands of people in that little beach town to Jesus. I got to tell you, it did not go exactly as I expected. There were other powers at work. There were spiritual strongholds, institutional strongholds in that city. And then there was the personal darkness and the strongholds and spiritual realities among the people who we were attempting to reach. I would learn over time that I had to pay attention to the battle going on that I could not see if we were going to be effective in the world that I could see. The local context, the industries, the power structures, the strivings and leanings of local residents, it all mattered. Now, over time and with much prayer and a growing engagement in spiritual battle, we grew effective in reaching people with the gospel and changing lives. 
We witness the power of the Holy Spirit working through a surrendered and dependent people willing to live on mission with God. It was a beautiful experience. Now, I'm older now, and we're planting this church, Big House Church, and we are not in Southern California context anymore. The the people are different here. Their pursuits and passions are different, and their experience with religion is almost entirely different from our first church plant. But I got to tell you, the mission is still the same. Reach people for Jesus. And the battle to do that is still the same. The mission at Big House Church is to follow Jesus and change the world with the gospel one household at a time. And there is a spiritual battle that would keep us from even starting that following Jesus part. So to do what we need to do, we have to take into account all that is going on around us if we want to be effective in the power of the Holy Spirit and reach this city and beyond with the good news of Jesus Christ. To tell the world that he has come to save us. It's fascinating to make the connection that there's always something going on that we cannot see and that the spiritual realities impact the physical world in which we live and do ministry. These two worlds, the spiritual and the physical, have to be taken seriously when planning a church or when simply trying to live out your Christian faith. You need to connect the two together and see what's really going on. In 1999, one of my favorite movies came out on the big screen. It debuted before a bewildered audience forced to imagine a world where things are not as they appear. That movie is The Matrix. Maybe you've seen The Matrix and the trilogy, in fact, that became the series. It's now considered among one of the best science fiction films of all time. It explores a world that's made up of two realities. One world exists in a computer-generated imagination of sedated and comatose humans reduced to batteries, energy sources for that, for those artificial intelligent machines. The other world exists in the dark and dreary real world where freed humans are locked into a never-ending war with those sophisticated, hyper-intelligent, non-human dependent machines. The battle scenes are epic, but the storyline, it is so good. It is, it is way too close to home, I got to tell you that, especially in today's uh, era, in what we use today. In fact, let me just ask my friend here, hey Siri, do you love me? I respect you. That's not quite what I need, Siri. I need some love. You know, Siri and I have spent a lot of time together in this quarantine, and I really do think she's growing to love me, and it's growing beyond just respect. But it's way too close to home, this whole idea of machines taking over the world and running things, and human characters, human life being reduced to an energy source. In the movie, the main character, Neo, he's a computer hacker. He's given the opportunity from humans who have escaped the matrix to see the world for what it is, to be awakened, to be aware, to be woke. In the now famous scene between the two movie characters, Neo and the leader of the human revolt against the machines, Morpheus, the audience experiences Neo's awakening. Morpheus explains that Neo has a choice. He can take the red pill and see what his life is really made of, slavery, entrapment, mental prison, and physical isolation. Or he can take the blue pill and live in ignorant bliss, but forever enslaved in a non-life existence and never truly live. Well, Neil makes his choice. He chooses the red pill and he awakens to the reality of the two worlds. The new world is nothing like the imagined world that he thought he was living in. The real world is harsh. It's viscerally and physically challenging, but it's emotionally and relationally richer and more satisfying. With his awakening, there is a chance for real love. There's a chance for real life with real meaning and real relationships. And then this new awareness, this gained knowledge, 
Well, it does come with a sense of sadness and real struggle outside of the blissful ignorance of the matrix. For the first time, Neo is seeing what his world is really made of. Perhaps one of the reasons that the matrix was so wildly popular is that it speaks to the soul of humanity, which is so often striving to understand the something more than what we see or experience in our lives. There is a very real physical reality that is readily accepted by most. Now, there are those few people who go, I don't even think what we see is real. But most of us will look around and the things we can touch, the things we can see, the things we can experience, we agree, those things are real. But there's also a spiritual reality that many are unaware of and and they want to know more about. The spiritual world, the spiritual reality is a world that some dismiss while others embrace. And as believers, we need to not only be aware of these realities, We need to be equipped to function beyond simply flesh and blood, to function not just in the physical world, but in the spiritual world. See, there's a connection between the physical world that we live in and the spiritual world that we cannot see, but nonetheless exists all around us. So this morning, I want to expose some of those connections. I want to explore how they work together or against one another and how we are to operate in both worlds. It's important to be aware of that bigger picture and to be in tune with the reality of both worlds in order to better operate in such a way that you really do make a forever difference, a gospel difference. Now, these two worlds, the physical and spiritual worlds, are seen even in the opening of Scripture. Take your Bibles out and open to the Old Testament, the very first book, the book of Genesis. In the book of the Old Testament, Genesis, the author describes the creation of humanity. It it talks about when the human race was made by God, their creator. And what is so striking in the opening chapters of Genesis is the coexistence of both the physical reality and the spiritual reality. They're both there. In the first chapter of Genesis, we're told that the God had decided to make man in God's own image. Take a look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, and that God there, plural, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, the Hebrew word for man is uh, is where we get the name Adam, the name of the first man. Now, you'll hear that in just a minute. I'll talk about it. it. It is the description here, just one chapter later, that we see both the physical, spiritual, intertwined part in that first creation, in the first man's creation. In the second chapter, just look over to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. The author of Genesis explains the process of creating the first man. And it's so interesting. It says this, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. The first representative of all humanity was formed from what was already created out of the dust, from the ground. And this ties him to the earth. In fact, this roots Adam into the created world in a physical reality. But that is just part of the story of Adam's creation. Once Adam was shaped, formed, and crafted, he was not yet complete. It's in the second action where one finds the connection to the spiritual. The end of verse 7 says that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God fashioned from the dirt a vessel. And then God filled that vessel with his very breath. In Hebrew, that word is ruah. And then with the combination of both physical and spiritual elements, that vessel became a living creature. One of my doctoral professors at Fuller Seminary, Amos Young, points out that the Holy Spirit wasn't just at the beginning creating the world. The Spirit was intimately involved in creating humanity. I'll read you a quote from from one of his uh, books. 
Yet the Ruah of God does not make a solitary appearance at the beginning of the creation narrative, where the Ruah is hovering over the water. The Spirit of God hovered over the abyss. Ruah is also present at its culmination with the formation of Ha'adam, which is Hebrew for that first man, the man of dust. Only when the Lord God breathed into Ha'adam did Ha'adam become a living being. The Spirit's appearance on both ends of the creation narrative justifies rereading the creation story with an explicitly pneumatological framework. What does that mean? It means that we go back to creation and go, the Holy Spirit was involved not in just forming the land and separating land from water, but he was intimately involved in the creation of humanity. Human, humanity was created by the very Spirit of God and filled with that Spirit. The Holy Spirit's presence at the beginning of creation, the Spirit's creative function and life-empowering energy is what the church needs today in order to rightly live in both the physical and the spiritual world. From that first moment of becoming a living creature, humanity was living in the realities of those two worlds. The physical world, filled with all that was seen, felt, touched, and consumed, and the spiritual world, which is not as readily or immediately discerned or discovered. We have drifted from this truth. We need our own awakening. We need to be spiritually woke as followers of Jesus, aware of the Spirit of God at work within us and the Spirit of God working out in the world through us and all around us. Oftentimes in Scripture, the spiritual dimension is depicted as where the battle for control takes place or where the enemy Satan exists and manipulates circumstances. Writing to the early Christians in Ephesus, a first century Roman city, the Apostle Paul warns them that they're not just living in the physical world, that they're not just simply fighting a physical battle in order to win their city with the gospel. In reality, he says, there's so much more going on in this city. Take your Bibles and open to Ephesians chapter 6 and look at verse 10. It says this, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places." Now, those same rulers and those same spiritual authorities with malevolent motives have always been actively pitted against the people who follow God. And that, my friend, brother and sister in Christ, is what and who we're still fighting today. If you want an answer to all the evil and the hatred and the bitterness and the anger and the division and rage that you are seeing online or experiencing in person, look no further than the enemy of all humanity, Satan himself. The very one who hates that humanity was made in the image of God in the first place. The very one who hates that men and women are made in the image of God and that humanity was made for relationship with God and made in relationship with God. In fact, Satan will do everything he can to see the fall of humanity, to destroy that image, and to break that relationship. Truth is, as sinners, that image is tarnished and that relationship is already broken. That's the effect of the fall of humanity. That's why the good news is good news. Because the sin that separates us, that Satan caused, has been dealt with. And the offer for a restored relationship with God is offered through Jesus. In Jesus, we have real life. We wake up to the reality of both the physical and the spiritual. In Jesus, I got to tell you, it's the only place we truly live. It's like we finally come alive and go, this is what I was made for. I was made for a relationship with the one who created me. 
And we find this described in that same letter Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Just look back at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. I'll read you this. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were all by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But thank God for verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Satan's game has not changed. He still tries to keep us away from this message. That though we were dead in our trespasses and sin, though we were separated from God, Jesus has made a way for us to be forgiven for all our sins and be restored with God. Satan's game has not changed. He's still working through the sons and daughters of disobedience. He still has it as an objective to keep us buried in guilt and shame and to keep us unconnected to our Creator. And we need to be aware that the devil is pulling the strings of those who are his those who are not spiritually related to God, those who have not responded to the invitation to be made alive again in Christ, they are still just flesh and they can't see their enemies' strings attached to them. They are enslaved to Satan and to their own sin. The darkness we see around us is a reflection of the one who controls that darkness. But when a person comes to Jesus... The lights are turned on. They see things as they really are, and those strings are cut. That person is finally set free. They're no longer controlled by Satan. They're no longer tools in his hands. They're no longer functioning according to his agenda, and they don't have to follow him anymore. And they also don't have to follow their own desires to do evil because that desire comes from the inside of us. They're invited to live in freedom, free from rage, free from anger and bitterness and unforgiveness, free from lawlessness, division and hatred. That freedom is found in Jesus and lived in by the Holy Spirit. We need to be spirit-led followers of Jesus who learn to live out our lives in the Holy Spirit. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. That may be a word for someone this morning. I could just read that part. Just hear it again. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Why? Paul goes on to say why. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. Those two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. So what do we find? We, we find that the battle rages outside of us through our enemy Satan, and the battle rages on the inside of us through our own battle with sin. The battle we see in the world around us is sometimes the same battle we see going on in the world within us. There's so many times when we don't do the things that we want to do. There's so many times when we do the things we don't want to do. We are sometimes amazingly empowered and heroic and sometimes dark and spiritually we are cowards. But we're called to live according to the Spirit. We're called to resist the devil and he will flee. We're called to take a stand against all of his schemes, all of his nonsense, all of his anti-God raging coming through the world around us. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24 says this, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every 
part of our lives. Let me say to you, believer, you are called from Scripture, and you're called right now by the Spirit of God to live by that Spirit, to live by the Spirit of God. And in fact, you're called to be God's children because the Spirit of God lives in you. Romans 8, 14 is a great verse. It says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, are daughters of God. Now, this is good news. You wake up and you realize there is more than what I can see. There is both the physical reality and there is the spiritual reality. And the good news is you've been invited into a living spiritual reality with the one who made you. At the very beginning, he lifted up and breathed life into that first man of dust. And that is what the gospel says he's still doing today. He's taken those of us who are we're just vessels We're just clay. We're just earth until we're made alive in Christ. And if you've never asked Jesus into your life, you're still walking around without full life, without fully living, without realizing that there is so much more and that so much more is available through the person of Jesus. My encouragement to you this morning, those who don't know Jesus, is to ask him to wake you up, to bring you to real life and to give you his Holy Spirit to fill you. And for brothers and sisters in Christ who already know Jesus as your Savior, my encouragement is that you see the battle for what it is, that you acknowledge that it's not just against flesh and blood, but there is a long-standing battle between the enemy of God and his minions and the people of God and his followers, and that you would get on the right side of that battle even in the way you live your everyday ordinary life so that that empowers you to make a bigger difference in the world around you. I trust that the Holy Spirit will use you to make that difference. I got to tell you, speaking about the enemies, the minions of uh, Satan, there's, there's some good news here. God has provided benevolent, heavenly spiritual powers to fight back, to fight against Satan's evil spirits and to advance God's ultimate mission and objectives. And next week, we will talk about this and we'll bring it to life even more. So be encouraged today. If you're not connected to God, you can ask God into your life through Jesus right now. And like Neo in the Matrix, you can come alive and see what your world is truly meant to be. And if you know Jesus, there is a spirit at work in you that will overcome all the darkness that is around you. So be encouraged this morning and may God bless you. After this service, we're going to go a little bit deeper and talk about, so what does all this mean that there's a physical world and a spiritual world? How do you truly live that out as followers of Jesus? And I'll just remind you next week, I'll be talking again about spiritual battles and how can we fight them. So God bless you. We'll see you in just a minute. I'm going to invite Ryan to join me and we'll come and we'll just have a conversation together. Okay, church, we're back. I'm here with Brian Kennedy, our worship leader, and we're glad to join you for just a few minutes after the sermon to talk about, well, so now what? How do we apply what we hear? And in the conversation, the sermon, you heard it, it's about spiritual life. It's about the physical and the spiritual and how those two worlds work together. Right. And I use the term that we're to be spiritually woke. Yeah. Because that's how I roll. I like to, <laughs> I like to connect to you young people. Yes. So hip and I'm very hip. cool. And, uh, and people really are using that term for it all is, kinds it of is, ways. Yeah, it right? is. How are people, people using that term today? Well, yeah, I mean, well, what I does think, woke mean? I if think in a secular context, woke is to be uh, aware of things that are culturally relevant, to be kind of on the on the progressive end of things. You know, if, you, if you're woke, it means you are aware of... Uh, maybe social injustices that are happening. Um, so that's how it's used in a secular context. Uh, I think in a spiritual context, what's interesting to me about spiritual, like the using the word woke, and I'm, I mean, I'm glad you use it because there is a difference <laughs> though, because I think spiritual wokeness I and cultural wokeness are two completely separate opposite things. Yeah. And I think often... I'm starting to see a lot of people who are using it all in the same context. Like, well, if you're woke, if you're woke culturally, 
then that means you're also being woke spiritually. The problem is we live in a counterculture kingdom. Like the kingdom of God is counter culture. And um, it's a little concerning, actually, because a lot of the movements that consider themselves woke, um, a lot of the organizations that are what what we would say, oh, well, you're woke if you, you know, uh, subscribe to that way of thinking. It's actually really dangerous because they're not scriptural. They're anti-scriptural. And so we do need to delineate between spiritual wokeness is important. It's being, it's having eyes wide open to the real issue, which is like what you're talking about. We don't battle against flesh and blood. We battle against powers and principalities of darkness. That's spiritual wokeness. And when the Lord wakes us up through salvation, I mean, he literally takes the veil back and we're able to see the powers that we don't see, but they're actually, it's so interesting because I feel like we just kind of move over that verse so quickly. Like people know it, but it's become almost rote. But in reality, that's our reality. We do not battle against flesh and blood. When I see someone acting in a way that just doesn't make sense to me, I don't hold it against that person. I hold it against the power of the principality or the power of darkness behind that person causing them to act in that way. And and that gives me the ability to pray against it, not against that person. That poor person is just being used by a scheme of the enemy. Um, But I can pray against the, the demonic thing empowering that thing. And so that's why it's so important for the people of God to be spiritually woke, to be able to see in in a dimension that we don't actually see, but because we have the spirit of God in us, he gives us the power and the discernment to actually discern the things of the spirit and of the spirit realm. And we have to, in order to move forward as the body of Christ, especially in the times that we're walking into right now, we have to be able to discern and to see in the spirit realm. If not, nothing's gonna make sense. Like a good example of this is just a couple days ago, my friends and I, we were in Dallas. We were getting together to have lunch, and one of my friends wanted to sit outside. We were getting together to have a spiritual conversation about uh, a movement that we're all a part of and this and that. And so we all sit down outside, and we're all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this man comes up and just starts acting insane mm-hmm. right past the gates of the patio gates that we yeah. were eating at. And at first, We were all like, what is this? And it was very, it was weird. It was like very intimidating behavior. He was like pretending to be a wrestler. He had like an MMA belt on. And (laughs) you know, at first you're like, oh, this is silly. This man's silly. He's crazy. But the more that it started happening and the more that we were sitting there, we were sitting there for like two hours and this guy would not leave this post of just... It was literally like he was just there to try to intimidate us. Yeah. Like he was just doing all this weird stuff and he was like pointing in our direction. And it. And at first you could just, I mean, some people might just say, oh, that was a crazy person. But for me, because I do believe I have eyes in the spirit realm and I can discern things in the spirit, I said, what? What is this? Like at first yeah. you wanted to respond in fear because you were like, this, this man is crazy. He's out of his mind. We don't get this. But the more I thought about it, I was like, the enemy is so stupid. Like yeah. he literally sent this thing to yeah. literally be there. We couldn't have the conversation we wanted to have because it was constantly distracting us. It was trying to intimidate us. But all I'm trying to say, the reason I bring this up is it instantly made sense to me what was yeah. happening when I put myself in a spiritual realm, when I was like, this thing, this poor human being is being used of the enemy to try to intimidate this group of kingdom people who are part of a movement to bring the kingdom of God to earth. And, and, and the enemy sends this thing just to be there. And, and the reason I know it was the enemy is because the minute we got up to leave, it's gone. It yeah. didn't stay. It was literally the weirdest thing. And we yeah. all afterwards, I was like, what did you guys think that thing was? And everybody was like, ah, it was sent to intimidate us. Yeah. And so it, it was just like, but, but the reason I bring it up is to say, the weird world that we live in makes so much sense to me when I see it in a spiritual context. Even the things we're seeing in the news and and just the spirit of fear that's on our country and all the stuff that's happening, we can either just go, this is crazy, this is chaotic, we don't know what's happening. But in reality, we know what's happening. The enemy, the enemy's doing stuff, you know? And so 
back to what you were saying, spiritual wokeness is so important if we want to call it that, because we do <laughs> have to see, yeah. we do have to be awake yeah. to the things of the spirit because it is there. And as much as some people don't want to discuss spiritual warfare because it's weird and it's scary and we don't understand it, if we're not willing to, if we're not willing to understand it, we're not really going to understand a lot of the things of the walk of Christian Christianity. Yeah. It's it's like having your eyes. So that term woke in the world as it's used right now, I don't know that you can get woke enough because it keeps changing. Like, oh, we're woke in our society, but then you're not woke enough, so you're not woke like us. And it almost goes back to Gnosticism. We have special knowledge, all of that. Right. It becomes, becomes almost uh, empowering to only the ones who are really woke. woke. You go, well, I don't want it to be that when it comes to spirituality, but I do want it to be like what you're saying. The world makes sense when you see both the spirit world and you see the physical world. And that happens all the time where you go, now I see that there is a battle. There's a meta story going on. Right. And then there's my story going on. Yeah. And inside that meta story, the big story and inside my life, there's a battle going on for my heart, my yeah. attention, my mind, my activity. And that example is a great example. Yeah. Try I mean, that. I have example after example after example of where I could be like, this person was crazy. They were after me. They wanted only ill intent for me. And I could point the finger at the person and I could name them by name. And I and I could make a mess of my life by yeah. burning bridges with people because I'm, I'm seeing the human not the spirit behind the human. And the minute that I truly understood spiritual warfare, I mean, there are people that I've chosen to not associate myself with, but I don't hold it against that person. I hold it against that spirit and I'm daily praying against that spirit on that person. And, And for my own protection, I may choose to not associate with that person or that group or that organization, but, but I'm not, I'm not in anger against it. I'm not, I'm not sinning in anger going, Oh, those blah, 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 blah. I'm, I'm going, I'm praying against the spirit and, and for the, for the sake of reconciliation to see those people come to know true freedom, because we can either hold it against that person in anger, or we can see them in mercy and go, they're caught in bondage. Yeah. Like they're literally being used by the enemy and I'm going to pray that thing off of them and release them into the full knowledge of the grace of God into a new life where they become spiritually woke. And yeah. um, so it just changes your mindset. It it, ta- it allows you to see humans as just humans and, and anything that's happening there, it's, it's something else. We're not battling yeah. against flesh and blood. I don't need to lift my physical sword to you because you're hurting me. I need to lift my spiritual sword, my yeah. spiritual weapons of warfare against the thing that is being used in the situation, uh, you know? So there is a there's a call to the church to, to be more engaged in the spiritual battle. I know there's a lot of visceral energy. Mm-hmm. I talk to people who are so frustrated or so uh, so scared or so fearful or so angry or so. Yeah. You know, they're just moved all over the place. And emotionally, it just drifts all over. Yeah. And and there's a call for the church to go, hey, this isn't, see this the right thing. See this the right way. There's a battle going on, but it's not just happening on earth. It's a battle happening in the heavenlies. Right. And we need to engage in it yeah. rightly. So one of the things in this series that I want to talk about is how to engage right. in spiritual battle battles the right way. But I love the idea of being spiritually woke. If you've never asked Jesus into your heart, then the Bible says that you're spiritually dead. Yep. Like it's not, it's not sleeping. It's like you're spiritually dead. You can't do right. anything. Right. And then the Bible is so clear. When we ask Jesus into our life, we literally come to life. Come to life. Yeah. Uh, and I, I referenced that movie, The Matrix. I don't know yeah, your yeah. generation has <laughs> even seen it, but in my generation, it's yeah, a yeah. big deal. Right. And, uh, and how Neil came to life and was like, so this wow. is what life is all about. Yeah, there's some really ugly parts to this life. Yep. And when you talk about spiritual battles, here's what I know when I talk to people. There's a, it's a, it's a, there's a fear level and then there's a creepy level. And then there's like, is everything a demon level? There's all Mm -hmm. that conversation. And we'll cover some of that as we go through my encouragement to the listener is that if you are not spiritually awake, if you're not spiritually alive, it's because you haven't asked Jesus into your life. 
The Holy Spirit will literally infuse you with the presence of God in who you are and right. wake you up. Yeah. And that's one of the most in- incredible feelings. Like that's not a secret knowledge. It's not that you have to do X number of steps. And when you finally get to level seven, you can finally right. get in. It's literally from the get go. Ask Jesus in your heart. See the world for right. what it is. Right. And anyone can do that. And I want to encourage you. If you've never done that, you ought to do that. Now, there is a, some benefits to being uh, spiritually alive, spiritually yep. awake. And I want to talk about a few of those, and then we'll close up and we'll leave some more for next Sunday. But what are some of the benefits of being woke? Well, I was going to bring up 2 Corinthians 5, because I think overall the benefit is this. Like, the disciples walked in such courage because they understood this distinction between flesh and spirit, because... Mm-hmm. When the Lord says, uh, like, in baptism, we die, the flesh dies, and we rise alive in Christ. And then Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so the disciples had this crazy faith that they walked, not anymore in their flesh being. They actually, they gave no merit to the flesh. They were like, Mm -hmm. if I'm to die, I'm to die because I'm made alive in Christ. If I'm not dead yet, then I'm living for the sake of the gospel. Like they walked in this crazy courage because they didn't give merit to this because they saw themselves so alive in, in, in spirit. And it says like, In 2 Corinthians, he says, we're convinced that even in these bodies we live in are like folded up like tents. We still have a God-built home that no human hands have built, which will last forever Mm -hmm. in the eternal realm. And we inwardly sigh as we live in these physical tents, longing to be put on a new body um, for our life in heaven in the belief that once we put on our new clothing, we will never find ourselves naked. And then it says, that's why we're always full of courage. Even while we're at home in this body, we're homesick to be with the Lord, for we live by faith, not by what our eyes have seen. We live with a joyful confidence, yet at the same time, we take delight in the thought of leaving our bodies behind to be at home with the Lord. So whether we live or die, we make it our lives passion to live our lives Mm -hmm. pleasing to him. For one day we will all be openly openly revealed before Christ on his throne so that each of us will be duly um, recompensated for our actions. Anyways, I just love this idea of like they gave no merit to the body. They were like, so if I'm alive, I'm alive in Christ. If I'm dead, I'm even more alive in Christ. And so to walk forward with that idea that since we don't battle against flesh and blood, we battle against powers and principalities. What then is our weapon? If, if, if no man can, can harm me in this way, because for me to live is Christ, for me to die is gain. What the heck does that mean? If you don't understand this, how can dying be a gain? Well, it's a gain. If you understand that this there, they gave no merit to this. Well, so, it's almost like, get, let me jump in for a second, because I think it's, there's a really important thing that you're bringing up. If, you're, if you don't believe that there's more, if you don't believe that there's a spirit that goes on forever, right. this life really is all there that's is. All and that's have. why you hang on to it. That's why you're like, uh, if I did die, this would be over and I would ultimately lose. Right. But what you're pointing out right. in Christ, like you just know that there's an eternity right. and that you are safe in Christ for all eternity. Right. So this life isn't all there is. It's and, almost... It's almost like Paul would even be like, I count the present times worth nothing compared to the coming yeah. glory. And sometimes I look at, at at how we try so hard to hold on to the things yeah. of this world. And, and even as our government gets chaotic or things get chaotic and this and that, and we're trying to like pull it all down and make sense of it. I'm like, you realize your life doesn't actually really start till this is over. We're here on a mission, you know, like, why are you trying so hard to preserve something that's really not real on this side? And that's such a weird flip to be like, yeah, what? Because when you read these words of Paul, and he's like, I just really don't, I don't really care. You're like, why? Like, obviously, we're to we're to love and and, and steward the life we've been given. I, I'm not saying that. But to hold it at a weight that's lesser than the coming glory, I think is so important, especially in times of persecution or even just these weird times that we're coming into with cancel culture and things like that. It's like, don't count the things of this earth as any more than those coming. Count that so much more. Never give up the things that are coming in order to protect the things that you have now. 
Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, if this is all there is. Like the Bible says it. Listen, if you don't if you don't believe in Christ, if you don't have Christ, this literally is your best part of your life. Right. So so Paul says God forbid. Then eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Yeah. And so he says, You better you better get all you can here because eternity without God is a very long time. And so I love that perspective, being spiritually alive and going, No, there's more than what we see. There's, there's more than just here. And we can value relationship, people, and love in this life sure. knowing that there's more to sure. come. And I think that's right. super valuable. And that does give us a way to live that you go, that's attractive. Yeah. Like we've settled something in our soul yeah. that this isn't all there is. And we're not building a kingdom here. Mm. We're building a kingdom in heaven. We're building something for God that lasts forever. Right. And we're a part of what he's doing, not just trying to create our, our own. And I right, think that's right. a big benefit. Uh, I want to go back just to, just a real quick and we'll, we'll just wrap it up. What, what does it look like when you fight this um, spiritual battle, knowing that there's a war in the heavenlies and a war, to, war in the physical? And, and sometimes we'll make it into the grand scheme of things, like the guy that showed up when you were having yeah. a powwow and you're like, oh, the enemies obviously come right. and trying to just, dis, you know, discourage us. But then on the on the smaller things, relationships with those closest to us and mm-hmm. the way that we live out our marriage, yeah. the way we live out our parenting, the way we live right. out our neighboring, right. to realize that there's a spiritual battle going on inside of there yeah. is important too. Well, and it's, sometimes it's not even the spirit of the enemy. It's the spirit of pride, it's just which is your flesh. own thing. Yeah. Like it's your own. Sometimes, yeah. and sometimes we want to escalate an issue and be like, not today, Satan. And it's like, that's not Satan. That's you. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like so discerning yeah. of that too. But even still discerning of the spirit that it's not the spirit of holiness. It's not the spirit of God <laughs> in you. It's the spirit of pride on you. And so yeah. do I hold that against yeah. charity? Should she hold that against me? Or should we just acknowledge the fact that the spirit of pride is in the room and, and pray that thing off? You yeah. know, again, it's like, and that's how, you know, charity and I often, that's how we deal with things. I'll, you know, we're very quick to be like, Hey, that's flesh, you mm-hmm. know? And the minute it's said, it's like the fact that we acknowledged it, it's like, Oh my gosh, you're so right. I'm acting in flesh. I don't mean that. I love you. This and that, you know, so it's like to be able to just so quickly be like, that's not you. Like, I know what the spirit of holiness looks like on charity. And it's the most beautiful thing in the world. And the minute any other spirit is working in that, I can see it, you know? And so it makes it so easy to just be like, Hey baby, that's flesh. Like that's pride or that's insecurity or that's, and those are all spirits too. I mean, this, that's what I'm saying. Like all of this makes sense in the spirit realm, you know, but once you're able to just acknowledge it and call it out and be like, yeah. oh, yeah, I don't want that. I don't want to be acting in pride. I'm yeah. so sorry. How do we fight pride? With humility. How do we fight yeah. insecurity? With the confidence of Christ. So am I feeling insecure? Am I not wanting to go out and share Christ because I'm insecure? Well, I'm going to battle it with the scripture that tells me I should be confident in the faith that I have in yeah. Christ, things like that. So if you know how to call out the thing that's that's working, then you know how to battle it with the opposite, yeah. the 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 scripture of truth. And that's like, how do we, how do we battle this stuff? I mean, we, we know that our weapons are praise and thanksgiving. We can look at scripture when they, when Paul and Silas are put in a prison cell, what do they do? They praise at They're about singing. midnight. <laughs> they start singing and the so walls that, come tumbling that always down. always works for me. You know, <laughs> look at, look at the, uh, in Joshua, when they're uh, around, they sing around the city, they praise and worship for seven days and then the walls come tumbling down. You know, yeah. it's like, we know that that's a weapon that we don't even have to lift a sword to. We also know that the scripture is our weapon. It mm-hmm. says the sword of truth. This is mm-hmm. the sword of truth. And one thing that I can say is we constantly are encouraging people to pray go out and pray. How do we fight this with prayer? But the true weapon of prayer is when we use the sword of the word through prayer. And and I will never understand why this is the way that it is, but something powerful happens when we pray to God, the word of God. Yeah. I don't know what it is. And uh, that's the first question I'm going to ask and be like, why did you design prayer that way? But it is so powerful to take a promise of God. The promises of God never fail. They never run out. So we know that if there's a promise of it, and we also know that what we pray according to God's will will be. That's right. Well, how do we know that we're praying according to God's will? If it's in this, it's God's That's will. Right. That's right. So if I know the scripture, if I need to pray healing and I find the scripture that deals with healing in the name of Jesus and I pray that scripture over you, 
I can know that I'm praying according to God's yeah. will. Yeah. If, I, if I'm praying against a demonic power or principality, I know that we have been given because we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. We're seated above any demonic power of force. Yeah. And in the name of Jesus, I can pray against that by by claiming and saying the the, the, the word of God. So that's how we fight yeah. this battle. It's yeah. This isn't... I think so many people sometimes are like, we don't want to deal with the spiritual things. And it's like, why? We we know how yeah, that's, to battle that's what it. We're called to. <laughs> like yeah, it's not weird. We yeah. know how to battle it, you yeah. know? You don't get too obsessed with it. That's weird. Yeah. We're not supposed to study all that, you know. Yeah. But but if we've been given the authority to use this stuff and we've been shown yeah. through scripture that these are the things that battle and work, well then let's do it. Yeah. Like why why shy away from it when it's clearly there? Yeah, that's good. That's what we're going to talk about in this series, how to bring it to life, how to apply in your everyday ordinary life and praise and using the word of God and praying the word of God and praying for and talking to God about the battle that's going on in your life, that that's really the engagement. Next week, we'll talk about what does it look like to resist the devil and he flees? What does it look like to be aware that there's times where it's our flesh, uh-huh. our sin that's at work, and not necessarily Satan, right. you know, pulling the strings. You go, no, when you become a Christian, you're still, you still have that battle between your flesh and following sure. the Spirit. And without Christ, you have no hope of following the Spirit. Right. And so you're completely puppeteered by the enemy. And so you can cut those strings loose with Christ, and then you can loose the power of the Spirit in your life through Christ. And so, so I'm looking forward to more conversation and bringing this to life and equipping our people to not just live good physical lives, good, healthy relationship lives, but to live a good, healthy, spirit-soaked, spirit-led, spiritual life That's awesome. that helps us to accomplish the mission that God has given us. Yeah. And that's what we'll, what we'll come at this next week with. So join us. If you have specific questions, you can put those in the comments uh, underneath uh, on our Facebook or on our YouTube channel, and we want to respond to you. We want to engage with you. If you have questions about today's sermon, about our conversation, uh, we want you to live a life that is complete in Christ, reconnected to God through Christ, made alive through the Spirit of Christ in your life. And so, so I want to I want to encourage you. Reach out to us. We're glad to connect with you. Um, church, I want to give you the benediction. May you go off in this place knowing that you are on mission with God, that His Spirit will work through you, and that you are called to be a light of the world that shines, trusting that because of Jesus, that light will never be overtaken by the darkness around you. So go, church, and outshine that darkness and live spiritually alive toward the world around you. For you are sent in the name of the Father, for the sake of the name of Jesus, and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do it. You are sent to be the church. You are loved.